The man known to history as Georgi Dzhukov was born on the 1st of December 1896 in the village of Strelkovka in Kaluga province around 80 miles to the southwest of Moscow in what was then the Russian Empire. His father, Konstantin, was a widowed cobbler who married his second wife, Ustinia, at the age of 41 in 1892. The 26-year-old Ustinia was a peasant laborer who was a widow herself when she married Konstantin. The couple's first child, a daughter named Maria, was born in 1894, followed by Georgi two years later. A younger brother, Alexei, was born in 1902, but died within a year. At the time of Georgi's birth, the vast Russian Empire stretched from Poland to Vladivostok on the Pacific coast, and from the shores of the Arctic Ocean to the mountains of Central Asia, with a total population of some 140 million people. Georgi's native Kaluga province was in Russia's industrial heartland, and the nearby town was named Ugodsky Zavod, after the ironworks on the banks of the river Ugodka. Since 1996, the centenary of Georgi Dzhukov's birth, the town has been known as Dzhukov, after its most famous son. Russia was undergoing rapid industrial development at the turn of the 20th century, which was accompanied by an expansion of primary education. Unlike most peasant children, who were only at school for two years, Georgi received three years of primary education, which he started in 1903 at the age of seven. After completing his studies in the summer of 1908, Georgi was sent to Moscow as an apprentice to his maternal uncle, Mikhail, who worked as a furrier in the center of the city not far from Red Square. While working 12 hours each day, Georgi continued his education at night school. Georgi was a keen reader and in his spare time studied the Russian language, mathematics, geography, and the sciences, along with his cousin Alexander, Mikhail's son. After Alexander was sent to Germany to learn German, he taught Georgi the language during his trips home to Moscow. By the summer of 1914, the 17-year-old Georgi Dzhukov had completed his apprenticeship as a furrier. The outbreak of the First World War in August 1914 pitched the Allied powers of France, Russia and Great Britain against the central powers of Germany and Austria-Hungary, who were joined a little later by the Ottoman Empire, which ruled over Turkey and the Middle East. In the summer of 1915, Dzhukov was conscripted into the 5th Reserve Cavalry Regiment and went to Ukraine to join the 10th Cavalry Division in Kharkiv. Following training courses for a cavalryman and a non-commissioned officer, Dzhukov was posted to the river Dniester in Moldova in August 1916. Not long after, he used his German language skills to capture a German officer and won the St. George's Cross 4th Class. In October, he was knocked off his horse by an enemy shell while on reconnaissance, for which he received the St. George's Cross 3rd Class. After a hospital stay in Kharkiv, he returned to his original regiment at the end of the year. From his camp in Ukraine, Dzhukov received news that Tsar Nicholas II had abdicated his throne in March 1917 after mass demonstrations on the streets of the imperial capital of Petrograd, formerly St. Petersburg. The Tsarist government had struggled to manage the war effort. The economy was in crisis and there was a shortage of food in the cities. While the Liberal Provisional Government had official authority, actual power was exercised by the Socialist Petrograd Soviet of Workers and Soldiers Deputies and a countrywide network of Soviets or councils in which workers and soldiers could have their say in decision-making. By July, the Bolshevik faction led by Vladimir Lenin gained popularity as the only political group to demand an immediate end to the war. In November, Lenin and the Bolsheviks seized power in Petrograd on behalf of the Soviets. Dzhukov had been a member of his regimental Soviet, but his own unit was disbanded, and he returned to Strelkovka by the end of the year. In March 1918, Lenin signed the Treaty of Brest-Litovsk with the Central Powers, making large territorial concessions which increased German control of Central and Eastern Europe. This encouraged opponents of the Bolsheviks to take up arms. 
and Lenin authorized the establishment of a professional military force, the Red Army, to defend the revolution. Under the political leadership of Leon Trotsky, the People's Commissar for Military Affairs, former officers and NCOs of the Imperial Army were invited to join the ranks of the Red Army, and in October 1918, Dukov joined the 4th Regiment of the 1st Moscow Cavalry Division. In March 1919, he became a candidate member of the Bolshevik Party, which had been officially renamed the Communist Party in 1918, and a full member in May 1920. In June 1919, Dukov saw action against Admiral Alexander Kolchak's army, advancing on European Russia from Siberia, but by September, he was at Tsaritsyn, on the Volga River in southern Russia, where he was injured by a grenade. He returned to duty in January 1920 and was assigned to the 3rd Reserve Cavalry Division, but in March, he was sent to Rezan, southeast of Moscow, where he trained as a cavalry officer. He achieved good grades in all subjects and helped to train other cadets before graduating from the course in August. He was assigned to the 2nd Moscow Rifle Brigade, which consisted of two infantry regiments and one cavalry regiment. After seeing action in southern Russia against the anti-Bolshevik army of Baron Piotr Wrangel, in October 1920, Dukov transferred to Voronezh province to suppress a peasant uprising known as the Tambov Rebellion, during which was promoted to squadron commander and was awarded the Order of the Red Banner. One of his comrades in arms in the suppression of the rebellion was Alexandra Zuikova, who soon became his first wife. Dukov remained in the ranks of the Red Army after the end of the Civil War in 1921. In 1922, Lenin proclaimed the establishment of the Union of Soviet Socialist Republics, or the Soviet Union, which brought together the Soviet republics in Russia, Ukraine and the Caucasus, in what was nominally a union of equals, but in practice dominated by Soviet Russia and its leaders in Moscow. Lenin had suffered a serious stroke that year and died in January 1924. A power struggle ensued among the Soviet leadership, in which Joseph Stalin, General Secretary of the Communist Party emerged at the head of a dictatorship by 1928. Stalin's most prominent rival, Leon Trotsky, had been removed as war commissar at the beginning of 1925. His successor, Mikhail Frunza, instituted a reorganization of the Red Army's command structure. During the Civil War, the Red Army had a dual command structure under which political commissars attached to each unit could veto decisions made by army commanders. Frunza abolished the political commissar's veto in favor of a single military command, strengthening discipline in the army. Though Frunza died in the October of 1925 from complications following a surgery, he left behind a legacy of professionalism and discipline amongst Red Army officers. The Bolsheviks had abolished military ranks in the Red Army, but Dukov's responsibilities rapidly increased in the early 1920s and by July 1923, he was commander of the 39th Cavalry Regiment in the 7th Cavalry Division and soon received praise for instilling discipline and order among the ranks. In October 1924, Dukov was sent to the Higher Cavalry School in Leningrad, which had been Petrograd prior to Lenin's death. Dukov's classmates included Konstantin Rokossovsky, a former Tsarist officer from Warsaw who enjoyed a reputation as a talented cavalry commander, and Ivan Bagramian, an Armenian who fought for the Tsar in the First World War before becoming an officer in the Army of the Republic of Armenia, which was absorbed by the Red Army during the Russian Civil War. Both men played an important role in Dukov's military career, and they recognized him as the most diligent and talented student in the class. The course ended in the summer of 1925 with a forced march from Leningrad to the river Volkov and a swim across the river on horseback. At the end of the course, Dukov and two colleagues from the 39th Regiment decided they would ride all the way to their division in Minsk on horseback, covering almost 1,000 kilometers in seven days. In late 1928, Dukov became a father when Alexandra gave birth to a daughter named Era and the couple would have another daughter named Ella in 1937. 
In 1923, Dukov had recommenced a liaison with Maria Volkova, whom he had first met in late 1919, while recovering from his wound. And in June 1929, Maria gave birth to an illegitimate daughter named Margarita. At the end of 1929, Dukov went to the Frunze Military Academy in Moscow, studying the theory and practice of modern combined arms warfare, bringing together tanks, artillery, aircraft and motorized infantry. By the early 1930s, the Red Army had developed a doctrine of deep battle, under which a heavy assault column would break through the enemy defenses and encircle it from the rear. These theories were developed by Assistant War Commissar Mikhail Tukhachevsky, whom Dukov held in high regard, but whom Stalin considered a leadership rival. After graduating from the Frunze Academy in May 1930, Dukov was promoted to command the 2nd Cavalry Brigade in the 7th Division, where his old classmate Rokossovsky was now commander. In February 1931, Dukov went to Moscow to serve as a cavalry inspector, reporting to Semyon Budioni, a legendary cavalry commander from the Civil War. Budioni praised Dukov's leadership abilities, but added that he could be unnecessarily harsh and rude in his disciplinary methods. After two years at the inspectorate, in March 1933, Dukov took command of the 4th Cavalry Division, made up of four cavalry regiments a mounted artillery regiment and a mechanized regiment. From its base at Slutsk in the Belarusian military district, Dukov restored discipline and morale in his division and was awarded his first of six orders of Lenin in 1935. Dukov's four-year stint as a divisional commander coincided with a massive investment program in the Soviet military. By the end of the decade, defense spending increased to 25% of the state budget and the army's manpower increased from 1 million to 4 million. In 1935, the Soviet army reintroduced military ranks up to colonel and created the new title of Marshal of the Soviet Union. The five men awarded to the accolade included Stalin's close associates Clement Voroshilov and Semyon Budioni, as well as the politically suspect Tukhachevsky. Less than two years later, in May 1937, Stalin initiated a purge of the Red Army's leadership, during which Tukhachevsky and two of his fellow marshals were arrested and executed. The dual command system was reintroduced to assert political control over the army, and more than 34,000 officers were dismissed. Most of them were shot or died in prison. The expansion of the Soviet army and the purge of the Soviet officer corps allowed the likes of Dukov who kept his head down and raised few objections to the arrests and denunciations taking place around him to rapidly rise through the ranks. In July 1937, he was given command of the 3rd Cavalry Corps, and in under a year, he was named Deputy Commander of the Belarusian Military District in June 1938. The increase in Soviet defense spending during the 1930s was in response to the threat of war from Japan in the east and Germany in the West. In 1931, Japan's invasion of the Chinese province of Manchuria on the Soviet border led to fears that Japan might expand into Siberia. The growing power of Adolf Hitler's Nazi party in Germany created a new threat closer to home, as Hitler urged Germany's eastward expansion at the expense of the Soviet Union. In November 1936, Germany and Japan signed an anti-Comintern pact aimed at the Communist International, the global revolutionary movement founded by the Bolsheviks in 1919, but in effect directed at the Soviet Union. When Japan invaded northern China in 1937, Stalin provided military aid to the Chinese nationalist government. Sino-Japanese relations were further complicated by the Communist People's Republic of Mongolia, established in 1924 with Soviet backing. A series of border disputes between Mongolia and the Japanese puppet state of Manchukuo escalated over the decade, leading to skirmishes at the Kalke River, better known by its Mongolian name of Kalkin Gol, in 1939. In May, the 42-year-old Dukov was sent to Kalkin Gol to report on the 57th Special Corps deployed in the area. By the time of his mission to Mongolia, 
Dukov had served in the military for 23 years, more than half his life. He had fought in the First World War and the Russian Civil War as a cavalryman and took a close interest in the development of mechanized warfare. He was recognized as a hard-working officer and stern disciplinarian and not only survived but thrived during the Great Purge. Within days of his arrival at Kalkin Gol, Dukov carried out an inspection and sent a critical report to Moscow, following which he was appointed commander of the 57th Corps on the 12th of June. On the 19th of July, the 57th was reorganized into the 1st Army Group, allowing Dukov to report directly to Moscow. After suffering thousands of casualties fighting to defend the Soviet positions on the east bank of the river in July, Dukov requested significant reinforcements for an offensive in August. By the middle of August, Dukov had more than 60,000 men, over 500 artillery pieces, 900 tanks and armoured vehicles, and 500 planes. The opposing Japanese army had a similar amount of artillery and aircraft, but fewer than 100 tanks. The Japanese position running north to south was separated by the Kalasti Gol, a small tributary of the Kalakin Gol, running past the village of Nomonhan. Dukov planned to put the deep battle doctrine into practice by dividing his army into three groups. The central group, consisting mainly of infantry, would launch a frontal assault on the Japanese positions, while the northern group would sweep around the Japanese right flank to the north of Kalasti Gol. In the meantime, the southern group on Dukov's right would cross Kalakin Gol towards Namonhan, encircling the Japanese south of the Kalasti before linking up with the other two groups to trap the entire Japanese army. After being informed by his intelligence operatives that many Japanese officers had taken Sunday leave, Dukov's attack began on the morning of Sunday the 20th of August 1939. While Soviet bombers and artillery bombarded the Japanese positions, the tanks swiftly swept around the flanks, inflicting the majority of Japanese casualties sustained during the battle. After defeating a Japanese counterattack to break out of the Soviet encirclement with his reserves, Dukov declared victory on the 27th of August and the final pockets of resistance were eliminated by the 31st. For winning the Red Army's first victory after the Civil War, Dukov was made Hero of the Soviet Union the highest accolade of the Soviet state. While Dukov was defeating the Japanese at Kalkin Gol, Nazi Germany and the Soviet Union unexpectedly signed a non-aggression pact on the 23rd of August 1939. Stalin had attempted to negotiate an anti-German alliance with Britain and France, but the talks broke down as a result of mutual suspicions. The agreement enabled Hitler to invade Poland on the 1st of September, and on the 3rd of September, Britain and France declared war on Germany, marking the start of the Second World War in Europe. On the 17th of September, as part of a secret agreement with Germany to partition Poland, the Soviets invaded Poland and occupied the Baltic states of Estonia, Latvia and Lithuania. The Soviet invasion of Finland in the winter of 1939-40 proved a disaster with Soviet forces suffering more than 300,000 casualties in three months, despite enjoying numerical superiority. Dukov remained in Mongolia until May 1940, finalizing details of the border with the Japanese. By the time he returned to Moscow in early June, Hitler had launched his Blitzkrieg invasion of France, resulting in French surrender within six weeks leaving Britain and its empire to stand against Germany alongside the resistance forces of nations under Nazi occupation. Despite the non-aggression pact from 1939, Stalin believed that after subduing his enemies in Western Europe, Hitler would turn his guns at the Soviet Union. The calamity of the Finnish war demonstrated that the Soviet military had a long way to go before it could fight the Germans on equal terms. In May, Stalin began to reform the armed forces by reintroducing the titles of general and admiral, while reinstating thousands of surviving officers arrested during the purges, including Dukov's classmate Rokossovsky, who had been imprisoned since 1937. Stalin dismissed Clement Voroshilov as defense commissar and replaced him with Semyon Timoshenko, a Ukrainian general 
who led the Soviet occupation of Poland before restoring some of the Soviet army's wounded pride in Finland. In June 1940, Dzhukov was promoted to General of the Army and appointed to succeed Timoshenko as commander of the Kyiv Special Military District, the largest military district in the country, which covered the whole of Ukraine, including parts of Western Ukraine, which had been conquered from Poland. Dzhukov's reputation as an effective military instructor and disciplinarian came in handy as the Soviet troops suffered from poor morale and a shortage of supplies. Within a month of his appointment, Dzhukov led an operation to occupy Bessarabia and northern Bukovina from Romania, leading to the formation of the Moldavian Soviet Socialist Republic in August. Dzhukov's military activities in Ukraine put him in close contact with Nikita Khrushchev, the first secretary of the Ukrainian Communist Party, with whom he would cross paths many times later. Dzhukov's Kyiv military district was one of three military districts on the western border of the Soviet Union and would therefore be vulnerable to a German invasion. Accordingly, Dzhukov was expected to carry out the Soviet army's plans in the event of an invasion. A plan developed in the summer of 1940 predicted that the Germans would invade in the north via Belarus and the Baltic states, to Leningrad and Moscow, and accordingly the main concentration of Soviet forces would be in the north in order to counterattack. By October, the Soviet leadership came to believe that an invasion would come in the south in order to target the industrial clusters in Ukraine and southern Russia. Officials argued the bulk of the Soviet forces would be concentrated in Dzhukov sector in Ukraine. In December 1940, Dzhukov presented a paper under the title the character of contemporary offensive operations at a conference of senior military leaders in Moscow. Drawing on the examples of Kalkin Gol and the German Blitzkrieg in Poland and France, Dzhukov placed emphasis on coordination of combined arms tactics involving tanks, infantry, artillery and aircraft, with the view of penetrating deep into the enemy lines by pinning down the enemy in the centre and deploying strong mobile columns along the flanks. Timoshenko endorsed Dzhukov's arguments and added that defence could only be effective by preparing several defence zones. At the beginning of January, immediately following the conference, Dzhukov participated in several war games against General Dmitry Pavlov. Dzhukov commanded the German army in the first game and the Soviet army in the second and gained an advantage on both occasions. Stalin was suitably impressed that he appointed Dzhukov Chief of the General Staff and Deputy Defense Commissar. Dzhukov's elevation to political and military leadership positions was accompanied by his election as an alternate member of the Communist Party's Central Committee in February 1941. Although the Germans and the Soviets had developed close economic and military ties since August 1939, Stalin felt uneasy about German dominance over Western and Central Europe after the fall of France in July 1940, while Hitler refused to entertain the extension of Soviet influence in the Balkans. By December 1940, Hitler decided to invade the Soviet Union the following summer. In the spring of 1941, Soviet military intelligence indicated that the Germans were shifting their military strength eastwards. Though Stalin continued to believe that an invasion was not yet likely, and that British agents were attempting to provoke him into fighting Hitler. Dzhukov was involved in the continued development of war plans in the event of a German invasion. A mobilization plan presented in February 1941 envisaged an increase in the army's strength to 8 million men and 300 divisions. In May 1941, a revised version of the war plan was prepared by Deputy Chief of Operations General Alexander Vasilevsky and signed off by Timoshenko and Dzhukov. While the plan reiterated the expectation of a German attack in the south, followed by a Soviet counterattack, it proposed a preemptive strike while the Germans were still deploying. While some historians have cited the plan as evidence that Stalin was planning to attack Germany in 1941, Dzhukov's biographer Jeffrey Roberts argues that there is no indication that Stalin had approved or even seen the plan and the measures taken by the Soviet army during the first half of the year were not sufficient for a preemptive strike.
By June, the risk of a German invasion was heightened, and on the 19th of June, Dukov ordered Soviet commanders on the Western Front to move their forward command posts. While these orders were still being carried out, the German invasion of the Soviet Union, codenamed Operation Barbarossa, began on the 22nd of June 1941. The invasion force, numbering 3.5 million men, was formed of three army groups. Army Group North, targeting Leningrad, Army Group Center, targeting Moscow, and Army Group South, headed for Ukraine. The Germans hoped to repeat what they had done in Poland and France by breaking through the enemy line and encircling them from the rear. Although the Soviets had anticipated the main German attack to be the South, the bulk of the invasion force was directed at Leningrad and Moscow. Nevertheless, on the evening of the 22nd, Dukov and Timoshenko issued orders for counteroffensives in Belarus and Ukraine. Dukov personally supervised the counteroffensive in Ukraine, which temporarily held back the German attack. But General Pavlov's operations in Belarus enabled the Germans to attack his exposed flanks and encircle Minsk, capturing 400,000 Soviet prisoners in the process. While Stalin angrily berated Dukov for failing to keep him informed of the military situation, General Pavlov was arrested for treason and executed within a month. On the 10th of July, Stalin took personal charge of the Soviet war effort by becoming supreme commander of the Soviet armed forces, head of the Defense Commissariat and chair of the Supreme Command Headquarters, or Stavka. In the meantime, Voroshilov, Timoshenko, and Budioni were placed in charge of the Soviet forces in the Northwest, West, and Southwest, respectively. During the first month of the war, Dukov followed Soviet doctrine by issuing a series of orders for counterattacks, which gained little ground and sustained heavy casualties. Nevertheless, he retained his composure and on the 15th of July issued instructions on the front to reorganize the large, unwieldy army and corps commands to enable commanders to respond more effectively and rapidly to changing situations. On the 30th of July, Stalin ordered Dukov to command the reserve front and lead a counteroffensive against the German bulge or salient at Yelnya, near Smolensk. In his autobiography, Dukov claimed that he had been removed by Stalin as chief of staff on the 29th, after the latter disagreed with Dukov's proposal to withdraw from Kiev. Jeffrey Roberts argues that Dukov had adopted this narrative to distance himself from the disaster befalling the southwestern front in Kyiv. Stalin believed that the Soviet defeats at the beginning of the war were due to poor discipline in the army. On the 16th of August, he signed an order for Soviet troops not to retreat one step, with extreme repercussions for the so-called deserters and their families. The directive prevented Soviet troops from retreating in good order and exposed large army formations to encirclement. By mid-September, the Germans had encircled Kyiv and inflicted more than 700,000 Soviet casualties. Dukov was far more successful in conducting the Yelnya offensive, one of several counterattacks designed to hinder the German offensive towards Moscow, which prompted Dukov's wife and daughters to evacuate from the capital in August. After his initial attacks were repulsed, on the 30th of August, Dukov resumed his attacks against the bases of the German salient, completing the operation to eliminate the salient by the 6th of September. Despite heavy losses, the Yelnya offensive was the first Soviet victory of the war and helped to restore Soviet morale. While Stalin may have had reservations about Dukov's immediate response to the invasion in June, and Dukov himself later admitted that he was unprepared to head the general staff, the success at Yelnya restored Stalin's faith in Dukov's abilities. Having regained his reputation as Stalin's troubleshooter, within days of his success at Yelnya, Dukov was appointed to the Leningrad Front to rescue the besieged city on the 11th of September. German Army Group North planned to seize Leningrad before linking up with Army Group Center to attack Moscow. By the time the Germans reached the outskirts of the city in early September, Hitler had shifted his attention to the capture of Moscow and ordered Leningrad to be besieged. For the Soviets, 
the loss of the country's second largest city would not only facilitate German operations towards Moscow, but would also have an immense impact on morale. As commander of the Soviet forces in the northwest, Marshal Voroshilov had delayed the German advance, but failed to prevent the enemy from surrounding the city on the 9th of September. With around half a million men at his disposal, but without any tanks or air support, Zhukov managed to stabilize the Soviet defenses on the southern approaches to the city. Though Hitler had already been withdrawing forces from Army Group North to support the attack on Moscow, Leningrad remained under siege for another three years, resulting in more than a million civilian deaths, though it did tie down German forces. At the end of September, the Germans launched Operation Typhoon, an attack on Moscow involving a million men, 1,700 tanks and 1,000 planes. The defense of Moscow was naturally the most important task for the Soviet military in late 1941, and accordingly, Stalin summoned Zhukov to Moscow in early October. Within days of his arrival, Zhukov was appointed commander of the Western Front on the western approaches of Moscow, supported by General Ivan Konyev's Kalinin Front to the north. Zhukov's task was complicated by the fact that in early October, the Soviets had already lost half a million men, encircled in Bryansk and Vyazma, southwest of Moscow. Before Zhukov's arrival, the line of defenses had shrunk to be centered on Marzhesk near Borodino, the site of the great battle between General Kutuzov's Russians and Napoleon's Grande Armée in 1812. After the collapse of the Marzhesk line on the 18th of October, the Soviet authorities declared that Moscow was under a state of siege. On the 1st of November, Zhukov issued an appeal to his men, reminding them of their illustrious predecessors who had defeated Napoleon, vowing that, in this hour of danger, we will not spare our forces or our lives in erecting a steel wall in defense of the motherland and in defense of its sacred capital, Moscow. While Zhukov was forced to withdraw further towards Moscow, his constant counterattacks weakened the German offensive, enabling him to reinforce his armies. On the 7th of November, the 24th anniversary of the Bolshevik Revolution, Soviet troops paraded in Moscow on their way to the front. In his address at the parade, Stalin appealed to the great heroes of Russian military history, Alexander Nevsky, who defeated the Swedes and the Germans in the 13th century, Dmitri Donskoy, who defeated the Tatars in the 14th century, Kuzma Minin and Dmitri Parzhaski, who liberated Moscow from Polish occupation in the 17th century, and Alexander Suvorov and Mikhail Kutuzov, who fought the Turks, Poles and the French at the turn of the 19th century. By the end of November, the Soviet defenses west of Moscow had withstood the German onslaught, and Zhukov was able to send reserves to turn back the German offensive. In the meantime, Stalin had built a large reserve force for a counteroffensive, which began on the 5th of December. Zhukov relied on his preferred tactic of launching a central assault to hold the enemy center, while carrying out strong attacks on the flanks to destroy the German forces attempting to encircle Moscow. Almost 400,000 Soviet troops attacked 250,000 men of Army Group Center, and by the end of December, Zhukov's men had advanced over 100 miles. Zhukov's successful defense of Moscow was not only celebrated by the Soviet press, but made the front pages of the Western newspapers. Stavka hoped to build on the successful counteroffensive by launching a more ambitious attack towards Vyazhma and Rezhev to encircle and annihilate Army Group Center. Stalin believed that once the initial German attacks were defeated, they would have no remaining reserves. And in January 1942, the 700,000 men of the Western and Kalinin fronts were thrown forward. Contrary to Stalin's expectations, the Germans dug in and held firm, and the offensive was abandoned in April. In his memoirs, Zhukov admitted that he had underestimated the enemy's defenses. Zhukov and the Soviet high command continued to launch unsuccessful offenses against Rezhev throughout the year, sustaining more than a million casualties in what was subsequently known as the Rezhev meat grinder. 
The Germans, by the spring of 1942, had lost over a million men, a third of their combat strength on the Eastern Front, without achieving their objectives of capturing Leningrad and Moscow. German strategic considerations were also influenced by the entry of the United States into the war in December of 1941, following the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor, which was accompanied by a German declaration of war on the United States. Faced with the prospect of the Soviets receiving American military and economic aid, Hitler decided to concentrate on southern Russia and capture the oil fields of the Caucasus. In May 1942, a major Soviet counteroffensive led by Timoshenko against Kharkov was defeated with a loss of almost 300,000 men. The Soviet defeat in Ukraine ensured that the German offensive encountered less resistance and by the end of August, the Germans had reached Stalingrad, the city on the banks of the Volga, which Zhukov had known as Tsaritsyn, prior to its renaming in 1925. The Red Army had lost over 600,000 men, 7,000 tanks and 400 aircraft in July and August. Although the primary German objective had been to capture the Caucasian oil fields, in July, Army Group South was split into Army Group A and Army Group B. The former was to capture Rostov-on-Don and advance over the Caucasus towards Baku on the Caspian Sea, while the latter would head east towards Voronezh before turning southeast along the Don and Volga rivers to Stalingrad. Timoshenko's defenses had crumbled and his southwestern front was reorganized into the Stalingrad front. After the initial clashes outside Stalingrad, on the 28th of July, Stalin issued a famous order, not a step back, echoing Zhukov's appeals during the defense of Moscow. Although Stalingrad was far less politically and strategically significant than Moscow, the city bearing the Soviet leader's name was an industrial hub which controlled access to the Volga and the Caucasus. Stalin continued to evoke past Russian military glory, and on the 30th of July, he introduced the orders of Suvorov, Kutuzov and Alexander Nevsky. Stalin recognized that patriotism rather than ideology was the motivating factor for the Red Army, and in October he abolished the role of political commissars in the Soviet Army. Soviet counterattacks failed to prevent the Germans from laying siege to Stalingrad on the 23rd of August. On the 26th of August, Stalin appointed Zhukov deputy supreme commander and sent him to Stalingrad as the Stavka's representative. The battle for the city involved the German 6th Army under General Friedrich von Paulus and the Soviet 62nd Army commanded by General Vasily Chuikov. Chuikov was under the direct command of General Andrei Yeryamenka, the commander of the Stalingrad Front, which also included several army formations supporting Chuikov's flanks. Though the Germans made steady progress on the west bank of the Volga, Chuikov continued to receive reinforcements from the East Bank. In early October, Zhukov criticized Yeryamenka's handling of the defense of the city and ordered him to turn every street and every building in Stalingrad into a fortress. After three months of heavy fighting through the streets of the city, the Germans were in control of 90% of Stalingrad, with the remaining Soviet resistance confined to the slopes of the Mamayev Kurgan a hill overlooking the center of the city and a narrow strip among the factories on the west bank of the Volga. Chuikov's army suffered 75% casualties but remained a viable fighting force. While the Germans were advancing inch by inch in Stalingrad, Zhukov and the chief of staff, Alexander Vasilevsky, were planning a counter-offensive codenamed Operation Uranus to destroy the besieging forces. At the same time, Zhukov worked on Operation Mars, yet another attempt to destroy Army Group Center in Rezhev. While Mars failed to achieve its desired objectives, Uranus proved far more successful. Launched on the 19th of November 1942, Operation Uranus involved the forces of three Soviet fronts, Yeremenka's Stalingrad Front, Rokossovsky's Don Front, and Nikolai Vatutin's Southwestern Front. Yeremenko would attack south of Stalingrad, while Rokossovsky would move in from the north. Vatutin would lead the main attack northwest of the city, and the three armies would all converge on Kalach in the enemy rear. 
Paulus was caught by surprise, and by the 23rd of November, almost 300,000 soldiers were caught in the Soviet trap, predominantly Germans, but also including a significant number of men from Hitler's Romanian, Italian and Hungarian allies. A German operation to rescue the 6th Army was stopped by the Soviet forces, though it managed to disrupt Operation Saturn, launched on the 16th of December to recapture Rostov. In January 1943, Rokossovsky led an operation to tighten the ring around the enemy, and on the 2nd of February, 90,000 surviving Germans surrendered, including Paulus. Although the Soviets had sustained 2.5 million casualties during the campaign, the Red Army inflicted 1.5 million casualties on the Germans and pushed them back to where they had been in June 1942. By the time of the German surrender in Stalingrad, Zhukov had been back on the Leningrad front to oversee Operation Iskra, an attempt to break the siege of Leningrad. The operation was launched on the 12th of January and achieved partial success by reopening the road and rail links by the 18th. The same day, Zhukov was promoted to Marshal of the Soviet Union. Later that month, he received the Order of Suvorov for his part in Operation Uranus. In February 1943, Dukov returned to the Northwest to oversee Operation Polar Star, an ambitious plan he developed to destroy Army Group North. But the operation proved a failure and cost the Red Army 250,000 casualties. Dukov soon returned to Moscow, where he was a member of a four-man group responsible for strategic decision-making, including Stalin, Vasilevsky and General Alexei Antonov, the General Staff's Chief of Operations. In a report to Stalin from April 1943, Zhukov predicted a German offensive towards the Kursk salient to support the ultimate objective of capturing Moscow. He proposed that the Soviet army should adopt a defensive posture before turning to the offensive. Accordingly, in May, Zhukov supervised the preparation of three defensive belts on the Central and Voronezh fronts, which met at the Kursk salient. Following on from their success in Operation Uranus, Vatutin was named commander of the Voronezh Front, and Rokossovsky served as commander of the Central Front. The two fronts had a combined 1.3 million troops, 3,600 tanks, and 2,800 aircraft. Another half a million men and 1,500 tanks, under the command of General Konyev, was designated as a reserve to support a counterattack. Dukov kept Stalin updated on the situation on the ground, and spent many hours in detailed discussions with General Rokossovsky. In the meantime, Soviet partisans operated behind enemy lines to disrupt enemy communications. The anticipated German offensive began on the 4th of July, as the German 9th Army from Army Group Center and the 4th Panzer Army from Army Group South aimed to execute a double envelopment of the Kursk salient. During the battle, Zhukov oversaw the Central, Bryansk and Western fronts, while Vasilevsky assumed responsibility for the Voronezh front. The Battle of Kursk was the largest tank battle in world history, involving 3,000 German tanks and 5,000 Soviet tanks. The German tank formations included heavy Tigers and medium Panthers, both of which outgunned the main Soviet battle tank, the T-34, which was cheaper and quicker to produce thus enabling the Soviets to enjoy a large numerical advantage. Though the Germans advanced several miles into the Soviet lines, the Soviet defenses held and the battle climaxed with the action at Prokhorovka on the 12th of July. Though General Pavel Rotmistrov's 5th Guards tank army suffered heavy casualties, the Soviets could afford to lose more tanks and the German attack was called off. Following Zhukov's plans, the Soviets launched two offensive operations both named after Russian generals of the late 18th century. Operation Kutuzov in the north was directed against Army Group Center in the Aryl salient, and by the 5th of August, Aryl was captured by the Soviets. Dukov personally supervised Operation Rumyantsev in the south, which captured Belgorod on the 5th of August, and Kharkov on the 23rd. A third operation, named after Alexander Suvorov, recaptured Smolensk in September. The Soviet offenses following the Battle of Kursk paved the way for the reconquest of Ukraine. 
while Dukov favoured encirclement operations to eliminate large groups of enemy personnel, Stalin considered these operations risky and preferred to recapture as much territory as possible on a broad front. On the 26th of August, the Central, Steppe and Varonezh fronts, which had taken part in the Battle of Kursk, launched offensive operations aimed at Kyiv and the eastern bank of the Dnieper River. As the Red Army advanced towards Ukraine and Belarus, the Varonezh Front was renamed the 1st Ukrainian Front, the Steppe Front as the 2nd Ukrainian Front, and the Central Front as the 1st Belarusian Front. As coordinator of the 1st and 2nd Ukrainian Fronts, Zhukov supervised the attack on Kyiv on the 3rd of November, resulting in the recapture of the Ukrainian capital three days later, successfully meeting Stalin's desire to liberate the city before the 26th anniversary of the Bolshevik Revolution on the 7th of November. By the end of the year, the Red Army had pushed the Germans beyond the west bank of the Dnieper. The first and second Ukrainian fronts, under Vatutin and Konyev, continued to advance in early 1944, before Vatutin was ambushed and shot by the nationalist Ukrainian insurgent army at the end of February. Dukov succeeded the mortally wounded Vatutin as commander of the 1st Ukrainian Front, continuing the offensive to the river Dniestr to cut off army groups south from Romania. At the end of May, Dukov joined Stalin and senior Soviet generals to finalize the plans for Operation Bagration, the offensive named after the Georgian prince Pyotr Bagration, who was one of the most famous Russian generals from the Napoleonic Wars. The offensive conducted by the three Belarusian fronts and the first Ukrainian front in the south was designed to destroy army group center and liberate Belarus. The operation was the largest Soviet offensive of the war, involving 2.4 million men, 36,000 artillery pieces and over 5,000 tanks and aircraft, an overwhelming numerical superiority over the Germans. As coordinator of the first and second Belarusian fronts, Dukov inspected the preparations for the offensive, which was timed to roughly coincide with the D-Day landings in France on the 6th of June. After initial preparatory attacks by partisans, the main attack was launched on the 23rd of June, and the Red Army captured the Belarusian capital of Minsk on the 3rd of July, along with 100,000 Germans from Army Group Center caught in the Soviet net. Though Operation Bagration cost the Soviets 750,000 casualties, by the end of July, Army Group Center had suffered 400,000 casualties of its own and was no longer a viable formation. After recapturing Belarus, the Soviet offensive continued into Poland. By early August, Rokossovsky's first Belarusian front arrived at the Warsaw suburb of Praga on the eastern bank of the Vistula River. The 20,000-strong 1st Polish Army, formed among the Poles who were deported to the Soviet Union following the invasion of 1939, was given the privilege of leading the attack. However, the Soviet offensive was losing momentum, and the Germans organized a strong defense of the Polish capital, which if lost, would open the way for the Soviets to advance on Berlin. Dukov and Rokossovsky's attempts to establish a bridgehead on the west bank of the Vistula, north of Warsaw, were unsuccessful, and the Red Army abandoned further offensive operations until 1945. While the Soviets were advancing on Warsaw from the east, anti-Soviet Poles affiliated with the Polish government in exile in London launched the Warsaw Uprising within the city. While Stalin was criticized for failing to assist the uprising, which was brutally suppressed by the German authorities, both Dukov and Rokossovsky asserted after the war that the Soviets had repeatedly attempted offensive operations during the uprising. In early September, Dukov supervised the Soviet invasion of Bulgaria during which the Soviets were welcomed as liberators and the pro-Nazi government was overthrown in a communist coup. After returning to Poland, Dukov was involved in planning for the invasion of Germany. The first Belarusian front would lead the drive towards Berlin, and on the 12th of November, Dukov was appointed its commander, with Rokossovsky transferred to the second Belarusian front. The decision strained the friendship between the two men, as Rokossovsky was unhappy that he would be denied the honor of capturing Berlin. 
In November 1944, the Soviet command developed its plan for an offensive, from the Vistula to the Oder River. Dukov's first Belarusian front was to capture Warsaw, advance to Poznan and take Berlin, while Konyev's first Ukrainian front would target Breslau, now Wrocław, the capital of the industrial region of Silesia. Between them, the two fronts had 2.2 million men, 32,000 guns, 6,500 tanks, and almost 5,000 aircraft, outnumbering the German forces more than fivefold. Stalin coordinated the operation himself, assisted by General Antonov, who soon succeeded Vasilevsky as chief of staff. The operation was to take 45 days, with Soviet troops marching into Berlin by the end of February. The Vistula Oder operation began on the 12th of January 1945, and on the 17th, Dukov had successfully captured Warsaw, with the first Polish army being the first to enter the city as planned. A week later, the first Belarusian front reached Poznan in western Poland, near the pre-war Polish-German border. By the first week of February, Dukov was crossing the Oder, hoping to capture Berlin by the middle of the month. In the meantime, Konyev's advance was going to plan further south, but the second and third Belarusian fronts had run into trouble in the north. Stalin ordered Dukov to halt the drive to Berlin and turn north to counter the German concentration in the region of Pomerania on the Baltic coast. By the end of March, Dukov was in a position to submit plans for the capture of Berlin. On the 31st of March, Stalin and the Western Allied commander, General Dwight D. Eisenhower, had agreed to coordinate their advances towards Leipzig and Dresden in southern Germany. But a few days later, after receiving intelligence that the British and Americans were planning to take Berlin, Stalin ordered Dukov and Konyev to take Berlin as soon as possible. The first Belarusian front would take Berlin and advance up to the Elbe River, while the first Ukrainian would attack German forces south of Berlin and advance towards Dresden. The German capital was heavily fortified, with three defensive zones manned by a million German soldiers and 1,500 tanks. On the 16th of August, Dukov launched a night attack on the formidable German position on the Zilo Heights to the east of Berlin. In the meantime, Konyev had obtained permission from Stalin to attack Berlin from the south, encouraging Dukov to quicken his attack on the Zilo Heights, which were taken on the 19th. The following day, both Dukov and Konyev ordered their tank commanders to race to Berlin, and the two fronts broke into the Berlin suburbs simultaneously on the 21st. On the 23rd of April, Stalin issued an order dividing the city between Dukov and Konyev, with the primary objective of the Reichstag building lying just inside Dukov's zone. Over the following week, both fronts fought their way through the streets of Berlin until the Reichstag building was captured on the 30th of April. The same day, Hitler committed suicide. The Soviet flag was raised over the Reichstag that evening by two of Dukov's men, an event that was later reenacted and photographed. Having led the Soviet defense of Moscow in 1941, the counter-offensives at Stalingrad and Kursk in 1942 and 1943, Operation Bagration in 1944, Dukov fully deserved the honor of capturing the Reichstag in 1945. In the meantime, Konyev's men linked up with the Americans at Torgau, southwest of the German capital, on the 25th of April. The remaining defenders of Berlin surrendered on the 2nd of May, concluding a decisive but expensive operation that had cost the Soviets more than 350,000 casualties. On the evening of the 8th of May, Dukov presided over the ceremony where the German instrument of surrender was signed. By the time the surrender came into effect, it was past midnight on the 9th of May in Moscow, and henceforth the Soviets celebrated the 9th of May as Victory Day. Dukov briefly returned to Moscow and was involved in the planning of the Soviet invasion of Japanese-occupied Manchuria. Led by Vasilevsky in early August, the operation took less than a week and coincided with the American atomic bombing of Hiroshima and Nagasaki, leading to the Japanese surrender on the 14th of August. At the end of May, Dukov returned to Berlin as commander of Soviet occupation forces in Germany. On the 24th of June, Dukov was back in Moscow to review the victory parade in Red Square, mounted on a white Arabian stallion. 
According to Stalin's son, Vasily, the Soviet dictator intended to review the parade on horseback, but had been thrown off from the same horse. The parade was commanded by Rokossovsky, while Marshals Konyev, Vasilevsky, Bagramian, and Yeremenko were among those leading the massed columns of the victorious Soviet troops, while 200 Nazi banners captured as trophies of war were thrown down against the Kremlin wall. After returning to Berlin, Zhukov was involved in the preparations for the Potsdam Conference in the summer of 1945. Zhukov showed British Prime Minister Winston Churchill and US President Harry Truman around the ruins of Berlin. Zhukov was not a delegate to the conference, but attended several meetings, and the three Allied leaders agreed that the country would be demilitarized, and after a suitable interval, the Allied occupation zones would give way to a unified German government. These aspirations would not be realized, as the wartime alliance soon broke down on ideological grounds, leading to the confrontation between Soviet-led communism and American-led capitalism in the Cold War. By 1948, the British, French and American occupation zones were united into West Germany, while the Soviet occupation zone became East Germany. For the time being, in late 1945 and early 1946, Soviet-American relations remained harmonious, and Dukov and Eisenhower developed a mutual respect for each other. In March 1946, Dukov was recalled to Moscow to serve as commander-in-chief of Soviet ground forces. Shortly after his return, at the beginning of June, he was denounced by the Soviet political and military leadership for egoism and disrespect for his peers, for refusing to share credit for the Berlin operation and other Soviet victories. One of his chief detractors was Marshal Alexander Novikov, who blamed Zhukov for his dismissal as head of the Soviet Air Force a few months earlier. Accordingly, on the 9th of June, Zhukov was dismissed as commander-in-chief and posted to the Odessa military district. The campaign against Zhukov continued, and in February 1947, he was removed from the party central committee. In January 1948, an investigation ordered by Lavrenti Beria, Stalin's secret police chief, uncovered a vast collection of valuable items including jewellery, furs and paintings that had been taken from Germany. Though Dukov pleaded that the items were not stolen and were given to him as gifts or paid for with his money, he was ordered to surrender the items to the state. On the 4th of February 1948, he was transferred to the remote Urals military district based in Sverdlovsk, now Ekaterinburg, and his name was written out of the histories of the war and excluded from the lists of marshals of the Soviet Union. Dukov's fall from grace had a negative impact on his health and he suffered a heart attack in 1948. In 1950, while in hospital in Sverdlovska with heart problems, Dukov fell in love with his attending doctor, the 24-year-old Galina Simonova. The relationship continued surreptitiously for a decade, hidden from Dukov's wife Alexandra until 1957, when Galina gave birth to a daughter named Maria. In 1965, Dukov would divorce Alexandra in order to marry Galina. By 1949, Dukov began to be rehabilitated, and in October 1952, he attended the 19th Party Congress and returned as a candidate member of the Central Committee. On the 5th of March 1953, Stalin died at his dacha west of Moscow, and the new defense minister, Nikolai Bulganin, appointed Dukov and Vasilevsky as his deputies. At the same time, Georgi Malienkov became chairman of the Council of Ministers or state premier, while Nikita Khrushchev emerged as the leader of the party organization. The most active member of the Soviet leadership team after Stalin's death was Lavrenti Beria, who uncharacteristically began to release thousands of political prisoners from incarceration and spoke of improving relations with the capitalist West. Other Soviet leaders feared that these initiatives were part of an attempt by Beria to seize power and Khrushchev, Malienkov and Bulganin plotted to eliminate Beria. On the 26th of June, Dukov was urgently summoned to the Kremlin and instructed to arrest the secret police chief. While Dukov admitted that he had little experience carrying out such an operation, he enthusiastically agreed to execute his orders. Within two hours, Dukov and a small group of armed officers, 
including the future Soviet leader, Leonid Brezhnev, arrested Beria and sent him to prison. Following a show trial, Beria was executed in December. As deputy defense minister, Zhukov supervised the development of Soviet nuclear capabilities and conducted exercises simulating nuclear warfare. Bulganin had been careful not to allow Zhukov any political authority, but in January 1955, Khrushchev secured Malenkov's dismissal as premier and appointed Bulganin in his place. On the 7th of February 1955, Zhukov was appointed Minister of Defense, and the following month, Ivan Bagramian was appointed to serve as his deputy. In an interview to the American press on the same day, he proposed a ban on nuclear weapons and expressed his hope for peaceful relations with the United States. As defense minister, Zhukov presided over the demobilization of more than two million men from the Soviet army, as Khrushchev sought to de-escalate the Cold War. At the same time, Zhukov and Foreign Minister Vyacheslav Molotov established the Warsaw Pact, a collective security alliance bringing together the Soviet Union and seven communist states in Eastern Europe. In July 1955, Zhukov accompanied Khrushchev, Molotov and Bulganin at the Geneva Conference, where he met Eisenhower, who had been President of the United States since 1953. Zhukov attempted to reassure the US President that the Soviet Union had no aggressive intentions and reiterated his desire for nuclear disarmament, though the West remained deeply skeptical. On the 25th of February 1956, following the end of the 20th Party Congress, Khrushchev delivered his secret speech, which criticized Stalin's cult of personality and his handling of the Second World War. He argued that Stalin had taken credit for victories in the war, which belonged to Soviet marshals and generals, including Zhukov. At the same conference, Zhukov had been elevated as a candidate member of the Presidium, the supreme decision-making body within the party, formerly known as the Politburo. Zhukov joined Khrushchev's denunciations of Stalin's treatment of the Red Army's officer corps during the Great Purge and Stalin's response to the invasion in June 1941. Under Zhukov's influence, Marshal Tukhachevsky was formally rehabilitated in January 1957 followed by General Pavlov, who had been scapegoated for the disaster of June 1941 in July. Although Zhukov did not have voting rights in the Presidium, his membership of the body allowed him to provide his input on political and military matters, and he played an important role in the Soviet response to the political crisis in Hungary in late October 1956. An anti-communist rebellion had broken out in Budapest, leading to the creation of a new government led by the communist reformer Imre Naj. Zhukov hoped that Naj would be able to stabilize the situation, but Naj's decision to withdraw from the Warsaw Pact on the 1st of November prompted a forceful Soviet response. On the 4th of November 1956, Marshal Konyev led a Soviet invasion of Hungary, which resulted in 2,000 Soviet casualties and 25,000 Hungarian casualties. Following his role in the Hungarian crisis, Zhukov was awarded his fourth Order of Lenin in December 1956, on the occasion of his 60th birthday. By the summer of 1957, Khrushchev's authority in the Presidium was being challenged by the old Stalinists Molotov, Lazar Kaganovich, and former Premier Malenkov. On the 18th of June, Khrushchev was criticized for his leadership by most of the Presidium members and Anastas Mikoyan was the only full member of the body to come to the leader's defense. The candidate members, Zhukov and Leonid Brezhnev, spoke in Khrushchev's defense, but did not have voting rights. Zhukov helped Khrushchev summon a meeting of the wider pro-Khrushchev Central Committee to discuss the matter, enabling Khrushchev to survive the attempted coup. At the plenum meeting that followed, Zhukov revealed details of Kaganovich and Molotov's complicity in Stalin's purges. Zhukov was rewarded for his loyalty to Khrushchev, with his promotion as a full member of the Presidium, but a few months later, Khrushchev turned against his Minister of Defense. In October 1957, while Zhukov was on a visit to Yugoslavia and Albania, he was denounced in the Presidium for neglecting ideological issues in the army. Following his return to Moscow, Zhukov defended himself from the allegations directed at him, but at a meeting of the Central Committee on the 28th and 29th of October, Timoshenko, Konyev, Yeremenko, 
Chuikov and Rokossovsky denounced Dukov's cult of personality. Dukov was duly dismissed from the Presidium and the Defense Ministry, and his conduct during the war was once again criticized. Although Khrushchev had promised to give Dukov new responsibilities, in February 1958 he was retired from the Soviet armed forces. He was under surveillance from the KGB, the secret police, and regularly criticized Khrushchev's policies, including the heavy investment in the Soviet space program. The KGB was particularly concerned about Dukov's memoirs, which he had begun writing in the late 1950s, inspired by Winston Churchill's six-volume history of the Second World War. In his memoirs, Dukov also defended himself against criticisms that he had failed to prepare adequately for the German invasion, and that he was a Bonapartist who had ambitions of seizing political power for himself. Dukov knew that his memoirs would not be published while Khrushchev remained in power, but in October 1964, Khrushchev was ousted by Brezhnev. This paved the way for Dukov's rehabilitation, and on the 8th of May 1965, the 20th anniversary of the defeat of Nazi Germany, Dukov was invited to the Kremlin. His popularity with the people did not wane during the intervening years, and for the rest of his life, he was bombarded with offers to give interviews and write for military journals. He was given access to Soviet military archives, and in the autumn of 1966, he delivered the 1,430-page manuscript of his memoirs. Dukov resented the edits made by the editors, supervised by state censors, but the autobiography was published in April 1969 and sold millions of copies in the Soviet Union and abroad. During the final decade of his life, Dukov basked in the glow of the Soviet general who defeated Hitler and captured Berlin and he was awarded his 5th and 6th Orders of Lenin in December 1966 and December 1971, marking his 70th and 75th birthdays. This period was a turbulent time in Dukov's family life, as his divorce of Alexandra in 1965 caused his daughters Era and Ella to cease contact with him. Though he managed to resume contact with his daughters in 1966, Alexandra died of a stroke in December 1967, the same month, Galina informed him that she was suffering from terminal cancer. Dukov himself suffered a stroke in January 1968, which paralyzed his left side. He and Galina spent long periods away from each other, being treated in different hospitals, and he was unable to make it to Galina's bedside when she died in November 1973, aged 47. Dukov outlived her by several months, dying on the 18th of June 1974, at the age of 79. His funeral was the largest Soviet state occasion since the death of Stalin two decades earlier, and on the 21st of July, his ashes were interred at the Kremlin Wall. Marshal Georgi Dukov enjoys a reputation as the most famous Soviet general of the Second World War, and as one of the best Allied commanders during the war, and General Eisenhower argued that Dukov deserved the credit for the defeat of the Nazis. Dukov was awarded over 70 military medals and decorations, both Soviet and foreign, including the French Légion d'Honneur, the American Legion of Merit, and the British Order of the Bath. Like many Soviet World War II commanders, Dukov began his career in the Tsarist army as a cavalryman. After the Russian Civil War, he climbed up the ranks and survived the purges in the late 1930s to deputy district command. At Kelkin Gol, Dukov won the Red Army's first victory since the Civil War, earning him widespread recognition and the key responsibilities of preparing for hostilities with Germany as head of the Kyiv military district and later chief of staff. Despite the disasters following the German invasion of June 1941, Dukov retained Stalin's trust and successfully managed the defense of Leningrad and Moscow. Dukov's counter-offensives demonstrated that the German war machine was not invincible, and as Stalin's deputy supreme commander, he played an instrumental role in planning the offensives that led to the encirclement of the German Sixth Army at Stalingrad in 1942, the partial lifting of the Siege of Leningrad, and the Battle of Kursk in 1943, the destruction of Army Group Center during Operation Bagration in 1944, and the capture of Warsaw and Berlin in 1945. Despite this superlative war record, 
He was also responsible for the costly Soviet attacks against the Rajev salient, and after the war, he was criticized for claiming too much credit for the great Soviet victories. Although Zhukov had no ambitions for political leadership, his popularity and prestige as the man who defeated Hitler's armies caused him to be sent away to distant commands by Stalin. His reputation recovered after Stalin's death and he played a key role in bringing Khrushchev to power by arresting Beria, a scene played memorably by Jason Isaacs in the 2017 British comedy film The Death of Stalin. As defense minister, Zhukov supported Khrushchev's efforts to reduce the temperature of the Cold War and prevented Khrushchev from being ousted in June 1957, only to have the Soviet leader turn on him a few months later. Zhukov's reputation was restored for a second time under Brezhnev, and he ended his days as a celebrated war hero. What do you think of Georgi Zhukov? Was he the greatest Allied commander of the Second World War, who saved the Soviet Union from destruction before turning the tide of the battle and masterminding the defeat of Hitler and the capture of Berlin? Or did he repeatedly make mistakes which cost more Soviet lives than necessary? Please let us know in the comment section, and in the meantime, thank you very much for watching.